we'll get started. Uh, good evening. Good to have each of you with us. Um, I'll go over a couple of announcements and prayer requests, and then uh, we'll turn it over to our guest speaker this evening. But good to have you. If you've picked up a prayer sheet, um, we might want to add a few things to it. So I'll add a, a family, a, a, one of our family needs right now. We have a our daughter, Becky um, Cook Sen, uh, has had a battle this week with a, a kidney stone. And they, uh, Jim had taken her to the hospital earlier the, in the week to try to get it resolved. And it was not resolved. Uh, she was in the hospital for a couple of days. And now the, she's going back to the hospital today. A lot of pain. And so uh, I'm not sure what the next uh, medical step is, but do pray for our daughter-in-law, Becky, up in Montana that she'll get that problem resolved quickly, quickly, quickly. All right, other prayer requests to add to the list that may not have gotten on? Anything else? Yes, hello, Troy. Thank you. The reason I'm laughing is Hezekiah just gave me three pens and pencils. That's what geeks have. That's what engineers, school of minds guys have, all the geek stuff, right? So let's pray for Troy's neighbor there. I don't even know how to work all these. No, oh, brother. <laughs> Need a class to take. <laughs> I think he's got a guy's pens. Okay. Uh, other prayer request. So pray for our youth group, those that were able to go with Pastor Stedman and the Whiteleys to Arizona. They had a, an eventful first day. Every mission trip always seems to have um, some car problems. So uh, they had a flat tire near Rifle. Uh, Colorado and I-70, and uh, Troy's dad saved the day. Did you know that? So I, I it's Nathan tried to get a hold of Skip. Skip he couldn't quickly answer, and uh, so he quickly called me and then got back to Skip. But uh, I, I knew that Troy's dad, who lives in Grand Junction, he knows every uh, stop on I-70 and any shop or mechanic. So I called him, and he was in the hospital wearing his uh, very attractive nightgown, and, uh, and fuzzy slippers. And when I called in, uh, the nurse realized that Ken said, this is very important. And so kind of stopped the, did he tell you all this? Some of the details, some were more funny. I can't share publicly, but they were really funny. <laughs> anyway, so I, he did take my call and I said, oh yeah, I got a guy, his name's Bob. He's, he's right there and uh, I'll give him a call. And he called him immediately. And within eight minutes, Bob was at the side of the van repairing the flat tire so um that was really awesome 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 and then they got i think four new tires on the van they were there's a lot of tread left in those tires but your dad said it was eight-year-old tires get rid of those tires so so it's the old ef hutton commercial when ef hutton speaks you listen when ken blumenthal speaks on mechanical things you listen in fact i listened yesterday for an hour i, I got an hour lecture can you imagine that? I got an hour lecture on how um, you prepare for a mission trip and the, uh, the how you cross, how you, like in airplane flights, Seth, you, you probably got this lecture too. You do your walk around and all that. So I got it. In fact, he repeated the lecture. It would have lasted 15 minutes. No, it's a, he repeated it four times. And I agreed every time. I wasn't like, I was arguing. I, I agreed with everything he said. So, but anyway, pray for the youth group and uh, their safety on the trip, and that that van will come back fine in one piece with everyone. I'm always nervous on mission trips when you're driving and you had a lot of people and a lot of logistics, so I'll pray for them. Okay, other prayer requests? Skip? Uh, 
Okay. So a kid who got injured in the soccer game. Okay. Okay. All right, let's pray, really pray for them. Thank you. Yep, Marlo. Yeah, let's pray for Roger and Phyllis Aw, uh, her uh, brother with cancer. Steve, let's pray for Steve. The Aws moved from Virginia to here, big move. We missed them the last couple of weeks so while they're on vacation. Okay, any other prayer request? Hey, go ahead, Troy. Yeah, let's pray for Bob and Linda Campbell. They've, they're moving from here to uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, they had to do an emergency stop on the way for Linda's situation with COVID and then um, some issues even on the way back, at a hospital stop on the way back. So rough, rough trip. So pray for Bob and Linda Campbell. We have a number of people with COVID, um, Rick and Diane Robbins, uh, Dwayne and... Um, um, uh, Dwayne and Dwayne and yeah, Shaw, Dina, Shaw, pray for the Shaws. Uh, yeah. Debbie Fleming's been sick. She doesn't get sick, but once every, you know, 30 years. So she'll be back in the office tomorrow. She, I, we just talked with her. She's doing much, much better. We do have the funeral on Saturday. Do pray for the, the Rachel Klein funeral. So Rachel, I think was 42 when she died. Um, so pray for the family. That's a really tough loss. She knew the Lord. Wonderful young lady. And uh, she will be greatly missed. Okay. Anyone else? Prayer request. Okay. Well, I'm going to pray for us in a moment. Uh, on Sunday, we'll have our normal ABFs. Uh, on, in the morning, we'll be in 2 Kings chapter 20. Uh, the story of King Hezekiah. He, he really shines with his trust in the Lord uh, with his own health issues. We'll look at that. And then uh, he just really falls apart in his trust level and makes some poor judgments with the Babylonians. And we'll talk about that kind of where there's some days we trust the Lord and do well. And there's other days we start leaning upon our own understanding. So uh, we'll do that in the morning. Then the evening, we will uh, get back to our freedom that last training We'll look at session four in the series of at least 10 that we are looking to present on how to deal with people with life-dominating sins. So uh, we will touch that, uh, get back on that track on the, on this Sunday night. And then if you would pray for the Richards, they have a kind of an open house intro to their ministry down south in their church plant in the afternoon on Sunday. We'll be, we're going to send a couple of our pastors down just to be an encouragement to them. Okay, well, let's pray here together. Help you for this evening. And uh, we think of uh, Gideon and just the few that he had that you used in wonderful ways in an amazing victory. And Lord, um, you've told us for two or three or more gathered together that you're in the midst of them. And uh, we trust that that is true tonight, that we'll sense your presence and we will lean on you to um, minister to people's needs. Uh, we know we have always physical needs. We think of our daughter-in-law, Becky, help her, help the doctors make a good decision what steps to take next. Uh, thank you, Lord, for our, our other daughter-in-law, Stephanie, who had a baby on Monday. We thank you for a healthy baby, big baby. And uh, we just pray for her recovery. We pray for Phyllis Aw's brother uh, with cancer and uh, what a battle ahead for him. 
uh, give grace to that family. For uh, Troy's neighbor with the uh, issues he's been going through, that you would minister grace, and that if he does not know you as Savior, that through these trials he'll come to know you. We uh, pray for the new church plant uh, as it starts off this Sunday, that they'd have a good response, good interest, and that you would prosper that work. We uh, pray for our services here, that you'd uh, bless uh, in our efforts to honor you, uh, continue to give grace in our own transitions. And uh, we pray tonight for the halfway house ministry. We pray for our Hispanic and children and youth work. And uh, we especially pray for the, the those who are on the youth mission trip, that you keep them safe, healthy, uh, preserve and protect, and use them in um, the realms that they're serving. And uh, bless. Uh, thank you for this evening. We thank you for opportunities to study a word. What a privilege. And we pray for Hezekiah as he shares a word with us that you bless him and uh, help us to be uh, good receivers of the word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're well aware by now that we're going through the book of Jude. Uh, tonight we have Hezekiah Mackey, one of our three interns for the summer speaking. Um, he'll be heading out with his family this weekend and has maybe one or two more tasks to finish up his internship, but is really winding down in that regard before he goes back to school. So uh, really good to have Hezekiah with us. Uh, next week, I'll pick up the next verses, and then we have uh, Pastor Skip and Pastor Nathan to complete a, a summer study, uh, almost verse by verse, and tonight, three verses uh, on the book of Jude. So I'll give you back all your technical, uh, technical pens and whatever these things are called, and it's all yours. Thank you, Hezekiah. Well, all I can say is if it takes a nerd to figure out a mechanical pencil, our world is in a lot more trouble than I thought it was. <laughs> so uh, as he was saying here, we'll be in Jude uh, verses 17 through 19. And uh, those of you who grab the notes may be thinking, oh, brother, like eight pages here. Don't worry. No, no promises. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we can get you out here before midnight. So we'll go ahead and start by uh, reading the passage here in Jude, verse 17 through 19. But beloved, remember the words which were spoken to you by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their ungodly, ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And so I've titled this um, the, the notes here, uh, remember the words. As we see here, the importance of scripture and, and Jude commanding them to remember the words which were spoken to them by the apostles. So below here, I have a quick summary of the um, book of Jude here. Um, so the who wrote the book of Jude, Jude did, and he wrote it to the believers. And it, he wrote it because he was concerned about the apostasy, which um, was coming in, uh, creeping into the church, the apostates. And uh, I have a list here of, of some of the topics here addressed in the passage, uh, negligence, ungodly lust, mockery, um, sensuality, and divisiveness. Uh, and these are the main topics that we're going to be talking about tonight. And um, there's what's happening before, uh, before verse 17 for context. Um, he was describing the most uh, the apostates in detail. For those of you who have been here uh, the previous nights, then you, you know um, what we've covered here. And then after verse uh, 19, Jude switches over to command the believers to build themselves up in the faith. So he's kind of going, okay, here's negative, negative, negative. Here's what they look like. Here's how you can avoid them. And now build yourself up in the faith to prevent these things from happening. So we're going to start here. Um, have on page two here. Uh, what is the point of the passage? And this here is just like a, a short summary if you want to go and read that in your own time of, of, of kind of like all these notes here. You can summarize it into these three questions here. What does the passage say? So what? Why is it important? And then now what? How do we act upon that? So uh, I'll let you guys uh, read that, but we'll go ahead and get in depth here. So the first part of the verse here, Jude is addressing the believers and he says, beloved. He is showing affection in his writing. You see this many times uh, throughout the book of Jude, where he says, beloved. Um, you also see Peter do this um, in 2 Peter 3, 1. He says, beloved. Um, th this is a very important part of the verse, because he is not 
commanding them um, or, or reprimanding them in a way without love. He's saying, hey, you know, I love you guys. And because I love you, this is what I'm going to tell you to remember. Um, so when we talk against errors, we should do it out of love and tender respect for uh, the good of the souls who we, we are talking um, to. Uh, we need to have genuine care when we address issues uh, of others. Um, and you can see that in Ephesians 4.15, where it's talking about speaking the truth in love. Uh, the next point I have there is love, love thinks no evil. Uh, love suffers long, is kind, does not envy, uh, thinks no evil. Uh, sometimes we can be earnest against error, and and Jude is is earnest against the error. You can see that in verses four, um, and uh, even before four, where he is addressing um, them. Let me see, verse verse five, where he is addressing them, um, and no, I'm in the wrong book. Sorry. <laughs> um, but where he is talking here, uh, he he's writing to them diligently in in verse three, yeah, uh, concerning the common salvation, and he finds it necessary to write to them, contending the uh, to to contend for the faith. So he is writing earnestly to them here, and he's saying this is a very urgent matter. But yet he is taking this urgent matter and telling them in love, um, so that they know that the love of Christ is is the reason that he's doing this. Uh, so we're looking at remember. This is the key word in, in this verse. And I was talking to Pastor Sen a little bit. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. I got both of the remember verses. So for those of you, for, uh, for, let me let me slow down a second. For those of you uh, who were here for uh, my first preaching session, uh, I covered verse five and it talks about remembering there. And so now this is the second part of, of the remembering. So he's telling them, instead of remembering the example of the children of Israel, remember what the apostles have uh, written onto you. And this concept of remember or remembering is very, very important throughout the scripture. You see this whenever there's something that is emphasized, and then you know that it's important. Sometimes it'll be emphasized in, in multiplicity of the times it's found. Um, when, when Jesus says, verily, verily, uh, he's saying, you know, pay attention because truly, truly, I say to you. Um, but here, when they say remember, he's almost saying like, guys, you, you should know this. This is like preschool stuff. Not like, oh, did you remember that time back then? He's like, guys, this has been in front of you and you've been learning about this in, in your church and you should know this. So more of a remembrance as far as pay attention, pay attention to this because this is very important for you to remember. And so I have seasonable remembrances of truth is a great way to help, uh, a great help and relief to the, to the soul. And in John 2, 22, um, it says, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scriptures. And this is talking about Jesus's resurrection. This was an encouragement to them because they believed it because they remembered that he had told them that he was gonna rise from the dead. Um, and though they had doubts that, that he was going to rise from the dead, um, they were able to trust his word because they had heard it. Um, and this goes into prophecy a little bit when it's talking about the apostles here, when he says, remember the words of the, the apostles in verse 17, uh, but you beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. These apostles here were inspired by God to call out these wicked people, the apostates, who would be infiltrating the, the church here. Um, and I have here, in, in events, it's good to remember prophecies because they confirm the soul and support it against distress and temptation. Both sins and discomforts arise from forgetfulness. And in Hebrews 12, 5, it says, and you have forgotten the exhortation. So we need to be wary against forgetfulness because by remembering God's word and his scripture, we are able to guard our minds against um, the current um, difficulties and tribulations we might be going through. Uh, the battle is in the mind. And seasonal thoughts or remembrance are, are truths and are helpful to overcome temptation. So lay up a good stock of knowledge that you may have truths always fresh and present with you. They will be, and I have a list here, a help to prayer, a guard against temptation to sin, a support in afflictions, and a remedy against error. And there's a supporting verses there um, along with each of those. 
because the word of God is, as it says in, in the scriptures, you know, pro profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for edification of the body of the saints. Um, and we need to remember not only what the word of God says, but to be able to apply that to our lives. And I can remember growing up, um, we had a, a program similar to Awana. It was called Joy Club, Jesus, Others, and You. And every night we would have memory verses. You know, you memorize as many verses as you could get points for your team. And my leader took me aside and he said, you do a really good job speed memorizing, but are you really taking to heart what you're memorizing? And as a little kid, I really wasn't because I was like, okay, I can get 10 points if I memorize this verse and I can get, you know, I just memorized as many verses as I could. And it was impressive in a sense, because they'd be like, wow, you memorized a lot of verses, but was I really taking them to heart, the meaning to heart? Um, and later as, as I was growing up, um, in my mid-teens, I took upon uh, the challenge to memorize the book of Proverbs, and I still have not yet completed it. There are 31 chapters, and here I am, 20, and I haven't completed it. Um, the goal is to complete it by 18, but, you know, we, we have to be humbled sometimes and realize the capacity of that, and also there's, there's just some motiva motivation, lack of motivation there. Um, but when I started memorizing the book of Proverbs, I took it to heart, and I realized this is not just memorizing the the words I so I can repeat them, but memorizing why it is so important and why these truths apply to me and how can I use these truths to apply. Um, so I would encourage you as you're memorizing the Word of God to to really see where that applies to you. So moving on here to the next part of the verse here, uh, where it's talking about the words which were spoken before. This is talking about specific instances. Um, and prophecies in, in the scripture here. Um, prophecy is of the Lord, um, of God, and we know this um, be, uh, from Isaiah 41, 22, uh, that he's shown the former things and known the latter end, and I have a list here of many prophecies that have come to pass, and this is just great proof for the validity of the word of God. You have Cyrus, he was mentioned 100 years before he's born, the uh, birth of Josiah 300 years before it happened, uh, building of Jericho 500 years before it was re-edified, and then the great promise of Christ and paradise um, accomplished 4,000 years after. Um, and there's references if you're curious about those. Uh, God has always been faithful. There's not one account in scripture ever where his word has gone void. Um, he is always, if he makes a promise, he keeps that promise. He kept the promises with Moses, uh, and he also keeps promises with us. Um, and now it's talking about apostles here. Uh, the apostles here are a very important part of this verse here in verse 17, where it says, by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the words were spoken by the apostles, and the apostles uh, were followers of Jesus Christ. But not only were they followers, they were given the, the Holy Spirit to be able to divide uh, the word of God and to be able to uh, sometimes perform miracles. and um, here we have the words of the apostles are the rule of the faith. So the apostles were sent from the side of Christ. These are very important people here. They had an extraordinary mission um, that, and call immediately from Christ um, as Christ had from the Father. So I have here for uh, John 17, 18, that you sent me, I also have sent them. And then John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, I send, I also send you. And so these apostles sent as agents of the Lord to proclaim the gospel um, as is the, the role of every believer to proclaim the gospel um, in truth to those who, who do not know um, the gospel. And uh, I, I found this um, interesting when I was, when I was studying here. Uh, Christ prayed for those to hear the gospel, those who hear the gospel. In John 17, 20, he said, pray for these um, who will believe through their word. And that's a paraphrase there. But that, that means Jesus prayed for me personally, for me to hear the gospel, the, the word of God and his truth. I'm like, wow, like I wasn't even born yet. I mean, yes, God knew me before I was conceived, but yet Jesus in his lifetime prayed for me specifically, Hezekiah Mackey, that I might hear the word of God and come to truth. And I was like, wow, just, that's, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so you're looking here, um, and if you read, if you read Jude, and you also read Second Peter, you'll see a lot of parallels between the, the books here. Um, and that is because Jude 
an apostle here, he quotes other apostles. He quotes Paul and Peter, um, and I'm sure he quotes some other apostles as well. But if you look uh, in Second Peter, there's some verses that are like word for word. I'm like, wow, okay, that's pretty important because it's repeated here. But Jude is, is bringing to the attention of the believers these passages which the believers had had um, from the epistles of Paul and um, from, from Peter. And he's saying, hey, you guys have these in your scriptures. Um, and I'm going to use them here to emphasize the point uh, which uh, about the prediction of the, the mockers here in verse 18. Um, and if you guys are curious later, you can take a look through um, as far as for, for prophecies. Uh, Daniel here is a prophet. He read the prophecies of Jeremiah, and Peter knew the epistles of Paul. Um, and I, I just find it cool that each one of these apostles here kind of like use the, the work of the other um, apostles or believers um, as authority because um, it was inspired by, by, uh, by God. And then here we have, uh, turn to my doctrine. Those that know, let them come to know more. This isn't just written to those who are hearing this for the first time. This is written to those that, that know the word of God. Um, and in Psalms 119.79, it says, turn to me, those who know. And that's a paraphrase there. But we are turning to the word of God. Those, those, those who are seasoned believers and have read the word of God, Every time we turn to the word of God, we hear his voice and we hear new, um, we, we can see new meaning through verses and scriptures that we have already read. But I find this interesting here that, that Jude, as he's writing to these believers, he's like, yeah, you guys know about these verses and, and you guys should be applying these to your lives here. Um, and he's not saying, oh, well, you didn't know, let me know here, heads up, you know, this is what's happening. He's like, guys, you, you know, you know what's happening here. So let me tell you again, because you know. And it's important that you actually pay attention. Um, what, what is told to the church in general is told to us. Um, and this here, I just have for a point as far as the scriptures here, even though Jude was writing to the believers back then, we as believers now can take the truths of the word of God here um, when he's talking here about the mockers in the end times. Um, I would argue that we have mockers today now in our age and this is very applicable to us now as it was applicable to back uh them back then um paul he uh, when he's writing uh he's usually writing to timothy uh, and then peter he writes to distressed uh, strangers and jude he is writing to us as the church um you have here um the context of which he speaks here i found it interesting here he speaks this is um you see, the author of Hebrews here, he speaks to the Jews as if the Proverbs were written, written to them. In Proverbs, uh, I mean, in uh, Hebrews 12, 5, he quotes uh, some verses from the Proverbs, and he says, which speak to you as sons. He's saying, all right, you know, these Proverbs here, you guys should have paid attention because these Proverbs, even though they were written before your time, were written specifically to you um, because they are applicable to you. Uh, the, the scriptures speak to every age, church and person and we should view the scriptures as a letter written by the hand of god from heaven to us personally um and this here was as i was studying here i was realizing many times we will take the the word of god the scriptures and we will stand behind the authority of it in a sense and say oh well the word of god said this um we we own the divine uh, i mean divine authority of the word of god but sometimes we as Christians, we don't even regard it. We, we will say, okay, yeah, you know, the word of God said this. And then we're off doing our thing in our, in our regular life. And then someone will bring this, you know, verse and say, hey, you know, this is what a Christian should do. And this is what you're doing right now. And we'll say, yeah, well, you know, you know don't, don't point your finger at me. Don't judge me. But if we really view the word of God as divine and, and as, as his word and his commands, we should take everything that we read in here to heart and personally apply it to our lives. We can't say, oh, well, that was written to, to the Jews. So I don't have to do that. Um, you know, that was, that was written to Timothy. So that's, that's not me. This is written to us as a revelation of God's uh, truth to us. And when we see something and we say, okay, as a Christian, this is what a Christian looks like. And this is what I look like. And it doesn't align. We need to... Through, through the, the help of the Lord, through the power of the Lord, 
get that right and and walk as a Christian would walk. Um, we have here, we should not be troubled at, his, at what is foretold. This here is, is, is a pretty personal thing um, for me. I remember growing up and dreading nap time. I would know every day, you know, it, it would be announced, you know, nap time, we'd be off playing on, you know, on the hill and, and doing what boys do, you know, making trouble, flinging pine cones at people. Um, but then we would hear nap time. We knew, we knew it was coming. And, and yet, it was, I was troubled. We were troubled, you know, before of what would be foretold here. And the Lord here has, has given us um, his word here and foretold these events here. The apostles here of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ here says in verse 18, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time and walk according to their own ungodly lust. So this here is a foretelling of, of what happens in the end times here. And we shouldn't take this and say, oh, no, you know, end of the world, it's, it's, it's nap time. Um, we, should, we should take this and use this as information like, like a military person would use. You know, you give them information, this person's going to be here at this time, you can take them out with a sniper. You know, things like that, because we use this information to, to better us rather than to, um, I guess, like, it, rather than dreading the coming of these people, um, the mockery. Uh, I mean, the mockers of, of, of the time here. Um, we are better prepared for evil when we expect it to come. In John 16, 4, it says, I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember. So he told him in the purpose that they may remember and have this, and it will be useful to them. Uh, when we experience God's truth in prediction, um, it helps us believe and depend on other promises of the word of God. Uh, it assures us that the Lord uh, has his hands in our troubles, for he told us before. He went out of his way in a way. I mean, the Lord, he's all powerful and through all time, but to tell us these so that we would be forewarned of, of this, this situation here. And so I have point to you about uh, mockery and sensuality. And yes, that was all one sort of big point, not really. Um, but this here, you get into verse 18, where it says, how, how, um, how they've told you that there would be mockers in the last time and would walk according to their ungodly lust. And I'll read verse 19 here as well. These are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. So here's talking about one person here. It's talking about the mockers in the last time here. And they walk according to the ungodly lust. They are also sensual people who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Wow, what a description of a person. Like, you know, if you're like, okay, you know, I'm Hezekiah, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm also like to collect rocks, et cetera. Like this is like, this is a pretty detailed description of these people here. Um, here where we, uh, in verse 18 here, where it's talking about how they told you it were, um, that there would be here, um, the people were told in writings in second, second Timothy three through one. And we kind of talked about this already a little bit, but they had this in scriptures. And so it wasn't hearsay as far as, yeah, did you hear what so-and-so John said? And, um, you know, he was talking to us at this gathering. This was here in the scriptures so that anytime the believers could open the word of God and see what the writing was here. Um, and I have here a couple questions here in the last time. Why do the scriptures speak of scoffers so much in the last times? It's a question. It's not rhetorical. Okay. Yep. So yes, it is a warning, and things are heating up when Jesus come, uh, when Jesus will come again. Uh, in his second coming. And also, uh, as we see the, the, I think the right word here is degeneration of the world. Um, this, ha this was happening in their time as well. The holy people were divided. They didn't want Jesus as their Messiah. And as a result, there were people who were scoffers, who were mockers, who said, no, you're not the son of God. 
Um, I can remember there, the, 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 the instances of those who mocked him on the cross saying, you know, come down. If you're really the son of God, you know, come down off the cross and, and show us that you are the son of God. I think many times we as believers, even though we don't directly or we would say we don't directly mock the Lord, I think it is a type of mockery to the Lord Jesus Christ when we don't believe him at his word and what he is saying. Because we're saying, in, indirectly, we're saying, Lord, you know, I don't trust what you have here written enough. I, I don't trust that enough to place my whole life in here, to, to dedicate my life to you. Um, you know, I, as you become those who are new, new believers and they have the fire of the Lord and they want to share the gospel, and then later the, the, the first, first love fades away and the mission, do we, do we not have enough faith to believe that when the Lord promises something, he is good enough to hold to that promise and that he will not fail? I think many times we as believers, we lose sight of the hope of heaven, of the hope of the gospel, of the power of the gospel. And we need to remember that because God is good, and because he has given us his word, he will keep his promises. And this should invigorate us. Oh, we're going to be in heaven someday. Do you actually believe that we're going to be in heaven someday? I hope you do. I hope you believe that, that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as, as your savior, that you will be in heaven someday. I don't, how, how do I say this without saying hope 500 times here? Um, <laughs> I don't hope that you hope as, as far as like, crossing your fingers like okay yeah i'm gonna be in heaven someday i hope i really really hope this is a hope as far as we know that we will be in heaven because of jesus christ and because we know that we should be all the more invigorated to do god's word uh god's work so here um we have a description of the mockers in verse 18 here it, they're called scorners or scoffers and if you're curious about scorners or scoffers, there's a whole chapter of it in Proverbs chapter nine about scorners and scoffers. And they will ask, where is the promise of his coming? And th this is in our day and time. Where is the promise of Jesus coming? You, you know, you churchgoers say that he's going to come back. I don't see him in the clouds right now. He, he's, he's not coming back. I can remember growing up in San Francisco area, we had billboards all over the place. I'm not sure if they had billboards here like this, but it would say, Jesus is coming, repent 2022 or something like that. Or it would give a specific day and time. And I would just look at those posters. I'm like, yeah, guess what? It's going to be that day in like four days. And if the Lord comes, no, no man knows the time. But I was like, I can guarantee you it won't be the day they printed there because the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He might come one day before the day they printed on there. And while the message is true, yes, repent, the Lord is coming, we have not been given the ability to prophesy that. And the Lord has told, him that, uh, told us that no one will know the day of his coming. Um, so here, the mockers here are described here as walking according to their own ungodly lust. Walking here implies their settled course. They're not, they're not how, how do you say this? They're not testing something out. They're continually walking in this. This is comfortable for them. They, they've been walking in this course for a while, and they're, they're still walking in this course here. On godly lust here, uh, to describe them here, because they are against God. They're not scoffers against just the believers. They are scoffers against God specifically because they are against his word. The scriptures speak much of evil in the latter times. You can see that in Matthew 24 or 49 if you're curious later. And they will, they will be desired to free, uh, be freed from every law of Christ. So among other sins here that are found in the latter times, you have scoffers. And this is what the verse here is talking about, scoffers, mockers, those who, who would make fun of or, or um, how would you say this, disrespect the name of the Lord and the, the word of God. Um, and this is not only a warning here. The way he he words this here, he's he's saying, okay, you know, I've told they have told you here, the apostles have told you that there would be mockers in the last time, and the reason they've told you this is so you can be aware of this. Um, so it's a warning to them here, and I have a list here below here of of things that can happen when um, you have you have scoffers here when truth is made questionable, assent is weakened, 
um, because of the scandals of professional Christians, many will turn to to atheists. We need to be be very careful um, when we are showing the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ to be consistent with what the Word of God says, to not be hypocritical, um, and to really be living for Christ truly, authentically. Because the world sees the church and they say, well, you know, this person doesn't go to church, you know, X amount of times a week, or they didn't, you know, they missed this youth activity, or, you know, they're really, they say they're a believer, but they don't, they don't show they're a believer by these words. And the world, the world can make a mockery of your testimony for Christ. If you're not careful um, that you are being a genuine testimony for, for Christ. Um, and it's, it's interesting here. You have this tier in Psalms one, um, Psalms 1, 1, where, where it talks about um, standing in the, the way of sinners and, and, and walking um, in, in the way, uh, loosely trying to gather this here, um, and then sitting in the seat of the scorner. These are like three degrees here of, of the sinners, and it goes like progressively from, you know, you're just standing in, their, in their, their presence, and then now you're walking with them, and now you're sitting, you're comfortable with this, and you're sitting in the seat of the scorner. So the, the scorner is like this, this third tier of someone who has already gone through the rest. They're comfortable with the sin that they are living in. And so because of that, they like compensate for that by making fun of others. So they're, you know, sitting in their sin and they're saying, okay, you know, ha, you tripped, you fell. That was your, you know, your first sin. And while they're, they should be looking at themselves and seeing that they are continually in sin, um, and I have here, when the conscience is seared, uh, they are turned scoffers and nothing will reclaim them. It talks about that in Proverbs um, 9 here. It says, do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Um, scoffers can be pretty mean, brutal people because they know what they're doing is wrong, but they're so calloused because they do it so much. Um, and all they can do is just mock you for, for tripping up or for doing one wrong thing. Um, and saying, hey, you know, you're not perfect. You should just become, you know, like us and, and you can make fun of people as well. Um, there is hope for those who repent in Proverbs uh, 1, 22 through 23. It says, scorners, turn to my rebuke and I will make my words known. Um, and that's a paraphrase there. But those who do repent, the Lord is always waiting for those who repent uh, to be able to take them in and, and bring them into his fold. These that cast off all the Lord's coming will certainly give themselves up to brutish lust. And I have that there uh, because earlier in the passage, when it was talking about the brutes, um, the brute beast who, who deny the Lord Jesus Christ, who deny the day of his coming um, and to ignore the fear of his judgment. These are really, it's really a continuation of the description here of the apostates here of mockery of those who have nothing to do with the Lord, who care nothing of the Lord, um, and they deny his coming because they want to ignore the fear of his judgment, the reality of his judgment. So here it argues a state of wickedness here to walk after our own lust, and that is when we sin, sin and lust are our constant practice. And this is something I struggled with as a young believer. When I first came to Christ at the age of six, I remember praying the prayer. That, that, was, that was the way it, it, thing was said. I knew how to come to Lord Jesus Christ. I knew I needed to put my trust and faith in him. So I did. I put my trust and faith in him. And what I expected after that, I expected this magical pony, you know, fairy tale experience where I would be floating and levitating and feel, you know, like, you know, my sins are gone. And, and I did feel a relief. I felt a relief that my sins were gone. But my attitude didn't change day one. I still fell into some of the same sins that I had struggled with as an unbeliever. I still had rebellion in my heart, even though I had accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. And the concept that I struggled with was sanctification, because sanctification isn't a process that happens overnight. And all of a sudden, you become sinner, saved, perfect. Perfect. The perfect was a long way to go, and it still is a long way to go. Um, and I really struggled with that. And the devil used that to tempt me to doubt my faith. Are you really a believer? You still sin this way. You're still mean to this person. Are you really a believer? You say that you believed in Jesus Christ. You say that you should love people. 
And those doubts were going through my mind for many years um, until about the age of 10 when I went to a summer camp. And I just, I just had to, to fix this, the, it, the troubles in my mind of not knowing whether or not I was saved. Um, and so I asked one of the counselors and he showed me Ephesians 1.13, um, which, which uh, says here, we'll turn to that real quick, Ephesians 1.13. I should know this verse by now, but I don't. But it talks about the assurance here of salvation in Ephesians chapter one here verse 13 and it says in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel to your salvation in whom you also have believed you were sealed with the holy spirit of promise and that verse there is the verse that i bring up every time the devil comes about and says hey you just messed up here are you really a believer i go to that verse and i say yes i am a believer because i put my faith in jesus christ and he is keeping me until his day um, and it's just a really encouraging verse uh, if you're ever doubting your salvation. Let's see what time we have here. Ooh. Might, we might keep you guys all night. So <laughs> see if we can wrap things up here very shortly. Let's see. So that was in context here with uh, Proverbs 24, 16, where it says a righteous man may fall and rise again, but the wicked shall fall um, into mischief is the rest of the verse there. Um, and just showing that you can tell when you are walking in lust, according to lust, and walking uh, in that path rather than just, oh, you just stumbled and you repented and you came back to the Lord. Um, when you're walking, it will become a habit of life. It says here, what, what is it to walk in sin? You will live to satisfy your lust. If you are living in sin, then you disregard the word of God. And you really are just living every moment to satisfy your lust, your sins. Um, and so the contrary of that is walk in the spirit in Galatians 5.16. It says to walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So here uh, he gives a description um, in verse 19 of the, the mockers here of whom the apostles spoke. And we, we kind of went over this already. But the three main things that describe them here are they cause division. They are sensual and they have not the spirit. Third one is very, very important um, because it, it distinguishes them from those who are in the faith. So causing division here um, signifies those who are just uh, there to pluck up the bounds that God has set and separate themselves from the church, cause separation in the church. Um, sensual refers to like animal-like, fleshly, corrupt. Um, they're all about themselves, how they feel, the way, the way they wanna do things. And then having not the spirit, um, this shows that they were never never saved in, in the first place. Uh, they never had the true grace and re regeneration. Um, they have nothing of the spirit. They are unbelievers. Uh, and so here's us talking about the sensual persons here, um, the, the mockers. It's describing them further in verse 19. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, having not the spirit. The sensual people are evil people. And here you have another list of, of ranks. And this is from 1 John uh, 2.16, where it talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Um, you have the fleshly lust, the sensuality, the lust of the eyes, worldliness, and then the pride of life, those who, who are, are proud here. So this falls into one of those categories of the, these, I wouldn't say great sins. It's not the way to, to weigh the word that, but these dangerous, dangerous sins, uh, fleshly lust of sensuality. And we need to watch ourselves to, to, to make sure that we do not fall into sensuality. And I have here some, some uh, short guidelines here that, that we watch the health of the body, make sure that we are taking care of the temple of the Lord and our welfare of our soul, which is guarding our mind, girding up our mind uh, to guard against the, the um, snares here. I have worldly pleasures here are a choice for fools. Wise men know them to be bait and snares. And then here, lastly, not having the spirit. Um, central persons are those who do not have the spirit. And you have here a list of here of those who uh, do not have the spirit. Um, they are central men. They don't have enlightening from the spirit. They don't have quickening from the spirit because they quench the spirit. And they have no comfort from the spirit. To get comfort from the spirit, this is a list on the contrary here. Um, they arise, the comfort from the spirit arises from meditating on the works of God. 
And it says that in, in Psalms uh, 104, 34, um, that my meditation may be sweet. Um, because if we meditate on the word of God, then we get the comfort from the spirit. It talks about tasting his love. Um, we have tasted that the Lord is gracious in 1 Peter 2, 3. Contemplating our great hopes in 2 Corinthians 4, 18. We do not look to the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Um, but carnal men, people who are sensual, they can't, they can't relish any of this because they don't have the spirit. They can't exercise love. They can't exercise faith. They can't exercise hope because they have no hope. They have no faith. They haven't experienced God lo God's love. And so they can't, cannot love out of, out of um, consequence of that. And I just want to take us to take a moment to just think. As believers, we are going through life. We are sojourners here in this world. And we should be living for the line, not the moment. I'm sure you guys have heard the illustration of how this earth, everything within this earth is going to be a dot in existence. And eternity in heaven is going to be the line that continues on and has no end. And I have here that surely a moment in communion with God is better than the mirth that we can get in a pastime of an age. And so while you may be out there and, and saying, oh, well, I have this really thing, this, you know, this sin that I like to hold on to because it's pleasurable. When you come to the end of your life, and if you had continued in that sin, you'll say, wow, what a waste of time. I could have used my life living for the Lord instead of living for this pleasure, which is just gone in a moment. And when you get to heaven, not only will there be tears on your eyes as the Lord wipes them away and you are ashamed of, of how you used your life, but you won't remember all those pleasures that, that, that you had because the pleasures are a vapor. But everything that you do for Christ, you'll remember the, the, the things that you have done for Christ throughout your life um, because those are what really, really counts. Uh, that's what really counts. And in verse 19 here, when it talks about separation and this is the last point here separation and division um there's really two types of separation and division there is ungodly separation and there is godly separation because the lord does command us to separate from the world to separate from the, the wicked from the ungodly um but those who separate from the fellowship of the lord um are on are separating for ungodly reasons and those who separate or cause division um, in the church, divisiveness. Um, these people here, when it's talking about the central persons who cause divisions, these aren't only people who are choosing to leave themselves, but these are people who say, you know, are spreading rumors around and causing people to be divided in the church of the Lord. Um, and this is something that we need to be wary about in our churches um, is to spot these people out um, and bring them under the word of God, um, and so that they would be bringing people closer to the Lord, not causing division um, in the church here. And so I just want to wrap up here. I know I kind of skimmed through the, the last point here, but I feel like I feel like that um, you guys got the, the important part um, there. And you have a list here about that is demeaning to the honor of Christ, that his body um, is crumpled into small bits and portions. But the root of this all began here, the apostasy that Jude is talking about. Um, it began by forsaking the assembly of the Lord of God. Uh, in 1 John 2, 19, it says they went out from us. And the further of that verse says they went out from us because they were not of us in the beginning. Um, but we need to be careful as we come to worship the Lord in his house that we are coming with a spirit to edify fellow believers in, in the house of the Lord, um, that we are coming here to be sharpened by the word of God. If you enter church in the morning and you're thinking, well, how can I get back at so-and-so for, you know, the pink flamingo or something like that, then you're not thinking along the right lines and you should go to the Lord and consult him and say, Lord, I'm thinking these thoughts, remove these thoughts from me because this is your house and you would have me edify fellow believers. And if you have a problem with someone, go talk to them. Go talk to them, resolve that problem. Because if you are cons if you, if you say, oh, you know, well, it, it'll it'll get taken care of, and you sit there, and years and years and years later, you know, the problem is still there. The problem hasn't been solved. I remember a a couple in 
my church as I was growing up and they had a problem between the two and they both thought, okay, well, if we just leave it be, it'll be fine. And it finally ruptured many years later because they had not dealt with the problem and it resulted in their family leaving the church and many other families followed um, because of the problem. And that is not honoring to the Lord. Uh, deal with your problems um, through the Lord um, and through prayer. And so I have here three applications. These are the three uh, main things I would like you to take away from this passage tonight. God's word is timeless. It will always be, always was, and it is applicable to now, future, and the past. We should hide in our hearts so that we can live in it. Number two, a warning. Beware of mockers. Do not become one. Here, Jude gives a great description of what mockers look like. And if you're looking through your lives and you see any of these in your life, then there's a problem. Consult the Lord, repent of it, and, and come back to the Lord because this is the first step of becoming a mocker. And then thirdly, continue in the body of Christ and the assembly of his church. God has commanded us to edify each other, to, to come and congregate, because not only is his living in his word personally and doing your personal devotions and having personal time with Christ very important, but also having Christian fellowship among fellow believers at your specific church, the body of Christ. And that is how God intended it to be. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you for giving us the book of Jude, even though that sometimes it, it may seem confusing. I just want to thank you for revealing and opening our eyes so that we could take the scriptures and apply them to our lives, Lord, so that we may be better Christians and more like you. I just pray that every person here who is here tonight would be blessed um, by this hearing of the word, Lord, and that they would go home and be in your word daily be living the truths of your scripture, Lord. Thank you once again, in Jesus' name, amen. Excellent, Pascal. Let's have you stay here for a moment. Um, tremendous exposition of that passage, but you might have questions for him. So while we have him up here, any comments, questions, follow-up, discussion points for Hezekiah? It's really good. As long as they're not about mechanical pencils, I will try to answer them. So. Any thoughts? Go ahead, Lisa. Yes, I do. I have encountered a couple. Um, I wouldn't say they're super numerous. People like to keep to themselves a lot. Um, but we had a booth, a table. Um, I was uh, helping out one of the other Christian organizations and uh, we had the question, what is your purpose of life? We had people walk by the table yelling at, you know, yelling out at the table, uh, you know, you don't have a purpose in life. Or, or, you know, my purpose in life is to kill everybody or, or zombie apocalypse or just random things that would not necessarily relate to the question because they saw the question. And my, my leaning is they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. And so as a resistance of that conviction, they would yell out in mockery um about what they did not want to learn and they did not want to know um, but yes uh there there has been mockery um at the at the campus so it is sad but it is the world we live in so oh sorry i answered the question but let me repeat it the question was um <laughs> was there uh do i experience or have i experienced mockery at the colorado school of mines campus because being a secular university So the question is, do the professors ever mock Christianity or my position on Christianity? Um, I personally have not experienced, I would say, mockery in that sense. I had a professor who disagreed with my faith, and she made it known that she disagreed. She said, well, you're wrong, but you know, you have your personalized opinion, so if you want to be opinionated like that, you can. Uh, she also wanted to fail me, but she said she couldn't fail me because I was a good writer. Um, so... Yes, I've experienced opposition, uh, but not, I wouldn't say mockery. Um, I have experienced surprise. People are like, wait, you're a creationist? You actually believe in a young earth? And I was like, yes, I do. Um, 
but I, I wouldn't say mockery from professors like that. So they want to keep their job. And with the School of the Minds, the general kind of student that's there, uh, compared to many other students at other colleges, what would you say? What, how would you describe your fellow students in general swipe? Mm. Uh, on a general swipe, I would say there's two or three different types of students there. Their students are too smart for their own good, and they're the A, straight A students um, who get really frustrated if they get a B. Um, and they are the, the brains of minds. Um, and they usually keep to themselves. They're usually introverts. Um, then I would say there's the second tier who are good students and they try, they try hard um, and they're diligent, but they struggle with subjects. And so they bond together and form like this hive group uh, of students who work together to accomplish the task to pass a class. You know, it's not an every man for himself kind of thing. And those are the more sociable people. And then I would say there's your average person who doesn't really want to be at college and they're there because their mom or dad said they had to be there or because they were told that's the only way to get a good job and they usually end up dropping out of school um, or worse um, because they have no value in, in life. So, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Well, let's ask Daniel to get in line what the, what the students would be like at Boulder. You're, you're, this is back, going back, Daniel, to a CU grad. You were with us for all the Bible studies at the mines. What did you pick up? It's been a few years since you've been in school. What would you say the difference between the CU kind of culture, student body, and the mines? What did you pick up?
Good, thank you, Daniel. That's quite a commentary. I know you couldn't all hear that, uh, but some similarities with some serious majors, similar to the level of the academic challenge of the minds. So some similarities there. Uh, I, my, I was impressed with the, uh, the group. Uh, they were very respectful to, uh, for, to us old people. They were very respectful. I was teaching, very respectful. Uh, I was surprised to see that. We talked about that today, so for me, um, uh, the minds, I think their GPA uh, in high school, their their scores on the SAT or, or was it ACT? What do we have to do to get in to the SAT? You can do either. Either, okay. Uh, sky high, you know, maybe, maybe perfect scores even in some cases. SAT, 1600s. You can imagine that. Um, so, but you have elements of scoffers, I'm sure it both. So, so, all right. Any other question for as a kind of pray? So we're going to start our Bible study back up at the mines uh, as early as the 2nd of September. So pray for that. Uh, Hezekiah really is the point man. David Young is going to be with him. Uh, we have Diana Roggison will be there now. And we're getting contacts uh, from other sources, uh, freshmen coming in that are interested in cross impact. And we're going to send out a one sweeping letter to all the churches. Hey, if you have any students, uh, at the mines, let us know so we can um, connect with them, invite them out to cross impact. So pray for cross impact. Thank you. Excellent job. Well, well done.